Okay, I think we're back up. Okay, so yeah, the biggest problems with this trailer are, are very obvious. Uh, it, it is missing required uh, voiceover. You must have voiceover, and the reason you need to have voiceover is, you know, can be seen in the chat. People read at different speeds. Um, people read at different speeds, and uh, when people are reading text, they are not looking at other things. So if we replay this trailer, and hopefully it will, um, Google will let us do it. Yeah, if you read this, this if you watch this trailer again, um, it's uh, it's it kind of hard to focus on your really nice art um, uh, because you know people are reading these this text and and the text is moving on before they can finish reading, and so immediately that frustrates the the viewer because now they've missed information, they feel bad about that, got to go back and rewatch it again, got to pause, and they don't know what's going on. Okay, um, I think this trailer. Uh, maybe doesn't focus quite enough on its mechanics. Uh, it would be really great to, you know, get a few lines about, you know, in a deep dark forest, a little witch must help her grandmother improve her fashion sense. Use the power of the spells to manipulate objects in the environment. Dodge the spikes on the ground. Use the grappling hook ability to swing through the trees. Right, brew potions to improve your health and mana. Uh, that kind of thing can be extremely helpful. And as the narrator says these mechanics, you need to show them. Okay, can you get through the forest and save Grandma's five hundredth birthday? Right, <clears throat> that could be extremely, extremely uh, uh, impactful. Um, so, because right, right now I feel like I spend most of the trailer looking at black screens and and failing to read text in time. I'm, uh, I'm not really seeing the other beautiful stages you've got going on. Uh, this part is, is pretty useful. You're showing the player kind of move around. But I think you have, you have much better puzzles in this game than the ones you showed. Um, so, yeah, okay. You have much better puzzles in this game than the ones you put on footage. So I encourage you to, um, to show off your cooler puzzles toward the end. Uh, all right. Okay, it's yeah. We gotta we gotta do some. We gotta make some changes, team. But you'll do it. You'll do it. I know you will. Okay, well done. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Potato Studio. It sounds like there were typos in the last trailer too, so be careful. Journal entry number thirty-seven. Yesterday, I received a request from an informant asking me to look into the situation regarding a factory that shut down two years ago. Initial investigations suggest that the factory was rented out to a startup of 11 employees that all went missing, including the leading research engineer, Dr. Chen. According to my informant, the team successfully developed a Polaroid that is capable of teleporting its users and resetting objects in the photos it takes. My hunch tells me that there's a bigger story to investigate here. I'm gonna check out this factory today. Wish me luck. Okay, um, so this this uh, this trailer, as Ishwar is saying, spends a lot of time panning over pretty much nothing. In fact, it spends 50% of the trailer showing us nothing. Uh, uh, like, we're just seeing the inside of a facility here, which is good for about the first five seconds, but then it just keeps showing us that. It doesn't show us any interesting puzzles. It doesn't show us the fact that you can reverse time with the camera. It doesn't really show us very much that you can use the camera to warp. Um, it focuses a lot on the plot and the context and narrative, but it really should probably focus a little bit more on the gameplay. Um, the voice actor doesn't sound like a, a serious like investigative journalist to me. It sounds like um, it, they, their accent sounds a little bit funny and, and weird to me. I'm not exactly sure what it is. It sounds a little bit, I don't know. I'm not sure what it is. But the voice acting is really low balanced. And so I can't really hear it all that much. And it doesn't sound super serious. Um, so it doesn't really fit the tone of the aesthetics that you're showing off here. So I would, I would work on the voiceover, maybe uh, try the voiceover again, and I would spend much more of the game's, uh, the trailer's time focusing on the mechanics, maybe even right away. Um, you know, showing the player solving a puzzle by, you know, grabbing a key card, uh, taking a photo, grab a key card, use the photo to warp back, right? 
um, and that could be really, really helpful. Okay, this is a beautiful game with a lot of really creepy and cool and interesting stuff going on underneath it. Uh, so make sure a little bit of that comes through and make sure the gameplay um, uh, mechanics are front and center. Okay, thank you, team. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, making more out of the camera shutter and the fact that this is a game based around a camera could be really, really helpful for your trailer. Uh, let's take a look next at Mushroom Studios. Welcome to Mogu, a puzzle platformer about flipping and turning. As you bend gravity, the puzzles will bend your mind. Explore a vast world. So um, if, if, if the audience feels like this trailer just has a, a certain energy to it, a certain consistency, one of the reasons is music. Uh, this trailer does an amazing job of timing uh, transitions between footage to the music and showing stuff off to the music uh, and to the beat. Um, this game also has really, really excellent structure. Uh, where it starts off extremely simple, it's zoomed in. It a puzzle platformer about flipping, flipping and turning. And turning. Boom, right there. A puzzle platformer about flipping and turning. And when they say flipping, they show you a flip. When they say turning, they show you a turn, right? It's impossible not to understand, and it builds from there, right? As soon as you understand that as an audience member, then the developers, the trailer creators, can start to show you more and more complicated stuff with the understanding that you will kind of know what's going on. You can push stuff, right? Uh, the puzzles are getting more complicated. And then it goes into the incredible montage where it shows you all these cool puzzles. And then the why, the why at the end here is this beautiful shot where it shows, it tells you there's a huge world for you to explore in a ton of puzzles. Look at how big this is. Absolutely amazing. Uh, and uh, as soon as you see this as an audience member, you can't, uh, you, you have to go play them. Bah! And then an incredible feeling of professionalism and polish when the music lines up with fixing the logo, using the game's main mechanic to fix the logo at the end, and then bring in the credits. Incredible team, you really knocked it out of the park. Um, uh, it's uh, difficult, it's a little bit difficult for me to um, to offer any all that much that you should change, um, but I, I'm sure that we'll get some suggestions in the chat. Um, so uh, make sure to watch the Twitch chat. You'll get some ideas for things that you could improve or change. This is a really really fun trailer. I think the only thing that makes me a little bit sad is most of these background shots don't have many clouds in them, and they don't really have a whole lot of parallax. So if if you pause this trailer, this is not a beautiful looking screenshot because it just looks incredibly basic. The background is the biggest defender here. Um, so uh, footage with a slightly more lively background would be really, really impactful for this trailer's appeal. Okay, well done team. What a fantastic, fantastic draft. Okay, next up we have the Michigan Association for Zigzagging Environments. Okay. I understand, but no one has heard anything from the agents down there. We have to send them into the maze. So, you dare enter my maze? I assure you, your spares and training won't help you here. You'll go mad just trying to find your way out. That is, if my creatures don't cut you down first. <laughs> Mm. 
this game is full of this this trailer is full of character uh, and that's that's one of the great strengths of this trailer uh, the uh, the game leaves you with this kind of haunting laugh that makes you wonder like oh my gosh what is in this cave um, the uh, the game opens with uh, an, a narrator saying agents you know everyone we send down into this maze never comes back I recommend as she is saying that you show not the inside of the maze but you show like the overhead of the maze right show how big and creepy this maze is like a flyover that could be really really impactful it might be hard to record that with a high frame rate um, when you get to the when you get to the um, the attacking section you don't really have anyone that says you know, use the fire spell to deal damage. Use the ice spell to freeze. Use the puzzle spell to solve puzzles. Um, it, it's, it's, um, I'm wondering if maybe the narrator who talks here, who's a crazy villain, uh, uh, might confuse the players a little bit. Uh, there's more character than information coming from the person who speaks during this section. And I wonder if it could be cleaned up a little bit uh, to say, to give a little bit more information about what the player is doing. You'll never solve my puzzles. Your spells are useless down here. Even the fire spell, which deals damage. Now, um, that might be a little bit too cheesy, but um, think about how you can uh, maybe rearrange and edit your your vocals a little bit uh, to um, to come in at the exact moment they're going to be most useful. Um, I really recommend you have someone say something about solving puzzles here, because I don't think, I think this is supposed to be a puzzle, but it's not a puzzle. It's just a key sitting there, right? So you don't actually show someone completing a puzzle and getting a key for their efforts. Um, I also, you've got a really cool boss at the end. I recommend you show a little bit of that. Um, this kind of hints at a boss, but you actually have boss footage that you could potentially show. Okay. All right, well done, team. Uh, this is a uh, this is a good good trailer. This is a good uh, good draft. I look forward to watching it polish it up. Okay, next up we have Lucky Clover Games. Also, I think in that last trailer, the villain voice that came in was a little bit hard to understand compared to the first voice. Maybe it just wasn't quite balanced loudly enough. I'm not sure. Afraid for stealing a powerful secret weapon, you, a motorcycle vigilante, set off on a quest to defeat the evil Agent Smith and clear your name. Bike and blast your way through Agent Smith's defenses, including enemy motorcycles, tanks, and auto turrets. Collect scrap from destroyed enemies to make repairs and craft ammo so you can keep taking on the forces of evil. This quest will take all the good old-fashioned grit you can muster. Will you rain fire and win the fight for justice or meet the fate of an outlaw? Take the quest. Okay, uh, so um, the two voice actors that you used in this trailer have kind of different um, recording environments. Uh, the motor quest voice that you instantly hear is a little bit louder uh, uh, and I think a little bit clearer uh, than the one that comes after. And so if you, I, I recommend you you try and re-record if you can some of this or throw the voice clip into audacity and use audacity's noise removal function and then increase the volume of the voice it'll be much more articulate and players will uh, audience members will be able to understand what uh, the what the narrator's saying um i recommend that don't show the title screen don't show the title screen maybe until the end because this title screen uh it doesn't look great to see the mouse here and it's kind of redundant because in just a couple seconds, the game is going to say motor quest, right? And you see this right here. So it's kind of like show them the show them the title, which and then show them the title again. But wait, why did we do that? What was the point of that? You might start instead by setting up a camera that can record the player like going in slow motion over a jump or something. That would be a really cool opening shot to show off in a way that the title screen isn't quite as cool, okay? Um, all right, and also all of the footage that we have here 
almost all of it is from behind the player's back. Um, for all of your trailers, uh, one thing that really makes a trailer feel a little bit monotonous is when the camera type is always the same. You always have a shot like from the player's behind the player's back, or you always have a first person shot. In reality, what will happen is if you go out and watch professional trailers, uh, if you watch the Mogu trailer, what will happen is the dev team sets up cameras in the environment that are different from the normal player camera. And uh, this camera allows them to capture footage that the player wouldn't normally see. This makes the footage that you can use much more diverse. You, you suddenly, instead of a library of all gameplay shots where your camera is behind the player's back or it's just another first person shot, you have a bunch of footage that you can kind of splice in that shows different angles, uh, different uh, that frames the action in a different way, um, and that can be extremely effective. So uh, put in the effort this week. It's worth it uh, to get a really, really nice trailer that's going to impress people on itch, uh, that is going to impress your recruiters when they see this uh, footage, uh, and it's going to get people to play your game at the showcase. Okay? So uh, camera angle diversity is a problem in this trailer. It's a problem in a lot of trailers. I just haven't really mentioned it uh, too much until now. Um, okay, so well done, team. Uh, this is a uh, this is a good draft, very good draft. Okay, uh, let's keep going. So next up, we've got heads up. We're gonna finish up these next few trailers, and then we'll take our five minute break, and then we'll get back into finishing our business lecture, and then we're gonna try and race through our games and AI lecture. Okay. Next up, we have heads up studios. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Polly, the last cat on planet Hexon has been taken. Young witch, your time has come. Traverse unknown environments, dodge the Ice Master's minions, and solve puzzles using your magical prowess. But be warned, magical elements are scarce, and one must be strategic if they are to defeat the Ice Master. You must save Polly, for if you fail... <laughs> Alright, so uh, I'd like to point out the thing that we were just talking about, having diverse camera angles. This sequence is not in the game itself, but it's a really cool way to end the trailer, right? Because you get a, a good look at the boss and the, uh, the, the cat you're trying to save. It's not so great because we see the top here. We see that we have like a, a little bar at the top that is, um, yeah, not looking super great. Uh, and a lot of this footage, unfortunately, is very laggy. I'll also point out, team, it's really important. Um, you, the narrator talks about different spells in this game, but it's always, the footage is always showing the viewer like a thousand different things. So the narrator is trying to teach and guide the viewer into understanding the spells, but there are like four different spells here, and there are like, you know, 20 different boxes here, and there are items to be distracting the viewer, and there are enemy types, and there are is a warp zone, and there's you. Ideally, you introduce these spells one at a time, and you do so with a nice zoom in. You zoom in on the footage, you say... Or better yet, you, you have your in-game camera zoom in, so that's not a blurry blurry bit of footage you're using. And you just show really close up with no other distractions. Use the lightning spell to keep enemies off your back. Uh, you know, uh, Use the fire spell to get rid of blockades. Uh, and, and when you say those things, you zoom in and only show that thing. Then, in the second half of the trailer, you can show the uh, kind of depth and complexity of the puzzles to get players excited about the challenges that await them. Uh, this game trailer has a lot of footage that is very laggy. I think Twitch was saying it. Maybe they thought my stream was lagging, but no, it's actually the video lagging. Um, yeah, that, that does not look good. It should look good because it's a really cool transition. By the way, um, change the rotation on that character, okay? Uh, uh, we do not want certain camera angles. Okay, so um, yeah. And uh, I recommend removing some of the UI uh, when you when you record some of this footage that's just meant to demonstrate stuff. UI is something that matters to the player, but almost never matters to the viewer of a trailer. They just want to see the spells and only the spells. No distractions, okay? Another thing I'll point out is that this trailer begins... Kitty, kitty, kitty. This trailer begins with a really creepy, like, here, kitty, kitty, kitty. 
And that's fine if that's what you're going for, but the background music does not indicate something sinister is going on. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. Folly. So, here, kitty, 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 that is a dark thing to say with that kind of um, character voice. And then it fades to blue teal, which doesn't make much sense at all. And then the teal is gone, so that looks really jarring. Um, and the background music is like, da, 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 right? It's kind of this elevator music. Uh, it just doesn't fit at all. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not a good first impression, but I think with a few changes, it will be a very uh, interesting, at least, a very attention-grabbing first impression. Um, your character needs to, your narrator needs to make it more clear that this person is talking about, like, a kidnapped cat. So I recommend as soon as you show this footage and say, here, kitty, kitty, you show the cat being kidnapped or you show the cat in the cage, okay? Um, uh, so, yeah, all right. Because I don't think we ever get a good zoom in on the cat that you're trying to save. So a lot of viewers are going to wonder if that person was talking about cats or was just being a big jerk. Um, at the very end, we get a, a shot of the cat, but this is kind of the first time that play that audience members have a good chance of recognizing and noticing that, oh, we are trying to save a cat. It's literally a cat. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and, uh, yeah, the, I don't think the cat even appears. The cat probably appears, but the footage is super zoomed out and shows way too many distracting things. So you're unlikely to notice. Um, okay. So this is a really good draft, but we have a lot of changes we need to make uh, to get this trailer to where it needs to be. Okay. All right. Thank you, team. Next up, we have Phi Start. Well, thank you for all the, 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 the comments, chat. You're doing an excellent job. Okay, so let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, and and watch this. Phi Start. Hello. Okay. Hello, agent. You have a new contract. The target, the casino man. Reach the hidden meeting room and eliminate them. As usual, watch out for guards and dogs. Hide. Attacked. Distract. Think twice to move when it's your turn. Okay, um, so this uh, this is a, a decent uh, draft. It has a lot of the issues that a lot of the other trailers have, where there's no diversity at all in the camera angles and where the camera is. As a result, every shot looks pretty much the same, and even it, when the narrator is, is is explaining a mechanic like attacking, even when the player is explaining that you that hey you should attack right, um, it's really hard to know where the narrator even wants us to look, because you okay. The narrator says attack, right? So we're going to get to see the player attack. But where's the player again? Like, I'm new. I've never seen this game before in my life. Is this the player over here? Wait, ooh, that's a cool pool table. I like pool tables. Wait a second. Is something going down over here? I can barely see it because it's blocked by this image of a wall that's transparent. Uh, so you really, you really want to think about um, how you frame these and all the other things that could distract a player. There's a lot of text on the screen at pretty much all times. I recommend you get rid of it. Have a mode where you just turn off the canvas while you're filming footage. It should be just click a checkbox in the Unity Inspector to turn off all the canvas elements, hopefully. And then you can record much, 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 much better footage. You'll zoom in your camera on a certain location and that will give you perfect footage where you've got this zoom in of your player attacking, maybe with different items, right? So that the audience can see that there are a lot of different options uh, for attacking in this game and planning. Um, okay, uh, the narrator is really hard to hear. Uh, the entire game, the game's audio is balanced very low in general across background music and the narrator. Uh, I can barely hear any of it. Um, Reach the hidden meeting room. The uh, narrator is um, is okay, uh, but they're clearly they don't have a perfect recording environment. There's some noise here, a tinniness, and the delivery is really strange. Reach the meeting room. Wait, uh, it should be. 
Agent, you must... <laughs> Agent, you must reach the meeting room, take down our target, and escape with your life. Can you do that, Agent? I know you can. Right? Um, I, I recommend, uh, if you uh, didn't go for a voice actor on the voice acting club, all of you, go and see if you can get a voice actor on the voice acting club forums or in their Discord server. It's usually free. Uh, there are free auditions. The turnaround time can be very fast. Uh, you can totally get this done in a week if you want to. Because you actually have a little bit more than a week, actually. But um, I recommend you look into that if you can, okay? Uh, it will really dramatically improve the quality of your trailer um, because voiceovers are across all of your trailers. Okay, uh, good draft team, uh, but we do need more diversity in the camera angles, audio balancing, and we need some uh, footage that shows off these mechanics a bit better, okay? All right, so let's uh, keep going. Uh, next up, we have best effort games. Let's go ahead and take a look. Ooh, hold on, wait a second. What was that? Okay, good. Jump into action-packed beat-em-up style game Bail Noxie and defeat your foes before they have a chance to fight back. With a wide range of attacks to choose from, you must devise and discover different combos to destroy your opponents. Progress through various levels and come out victorious in the gladiator arena. As a trapped fighter forced into combat, you must claw your way out of the Colosseum to earn your freedom. Build up combos to unlock special abilities and use them to juggle your opponents back to the Roman Empire. Put an end to the reign of Rob the Durable and become a free robot once again. Okay, um, so uh, this is a good draft. It has a lot of the problems that all the other trailers tend to have. It is only gameplay footage. In fact, the, the most visually interesting part of this trailer is at the end when you show the, uh, the intro, right? In fact, this is actually the what I recommend showing at the beginning of the trailer uh, because it will, it will create a, a really nice first impression. Um, the, the narrator at this moment right here, the narrator starts talking about the different moves the player can pull off. But the only moves we really see here, well, we do see uppercut and dash. That's pretty much it. Um, take this opportunity, dev team, to say uppercut your enemies into the sky, right? And zoom in and show just someone being uppercutted. Once in the air, jump and pummel them into the ground while they can do nothing, right? And you show someone jumping into the air and boom, 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 boom. When enemies are far away and you must reach them, do a dash, right? Dash. You show a dash, reaching a few different enemies. You can show the hook shot, your special attack. I don't think the game ever shows that. Enemies got long range weapons like the flamethrower. Use the slide kick, and then you sh show the slide kick where you go underneath. Um, uh, you really don't want the viewer to be kind of wondering what these moves are. The narrator says there are a, a, a diverse set of moves, and then they only see like two or three of them. So isolate them, and then later on in the trail, you can show someone putting together a massive combo. Um, I recommend you. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Yeah, I don't think you ever show off the uh, the. Oh, you do show off the grab, but it's it's very like. There's no slow mo. It's not very dramatic. It's very easy to miss, and the camera isn't even centered on it. Oh yeah, it's it was super fast right there. It happens in a split second. I recommend slowing that down and zooming in and showing just that right, the claw coming out. Okay, team. Um, after after this uh, intro, which has like real life cheering. Uh, we go into this 8-bit music, and the transition is a little bit jarring. Uh, I would think about, brainstorm what you can do to make that a little bit less jarring. Uh, maybe the narrator says something like, thrown into a thrown into a deadly competition, a coliseum of, of, of chaos. right? Um, make people understand that this is a coliseum entrance. instead of. I, I initially thought this was like a, um, a church window. I'm not sure if, if uh, that's just me. But anyway, okay. Thank you very much, Step Team. Okay, next up, uh, we have our final trailer, uh, which is 3AM Studios. Let's take a look. And then we'll take our break. Altana. My friends, my family, and my home. 
You took everything from me. And so I'll take everything from you. I'll brave the fallout. Travel the waste. Break your men. Every single one. Until I find you. Oh, okay. Okay, so that ending is very jarring. It would be nice to have a fade there because it just it shows off something interesting the, and then it just instantly just... Bzzz. Um, okay. Uh, this game is... I really like the character here. Uh, it is pretty dramatic. However, there's some inconsistencies. At the beginning, the narrator says, Otana, with a very neutral expression, not very moody at all. And then it instantly goes into a very dramatic kind of Taken-esque, I will find you. I will destroy you, right? Um, and so that tonal shift is a little bit strange. It kind of throws you for a loop right away. Uh, either have the voice actor say Autana, right? In kind of a, a dark, uh, moody voice, or just don't have them say it. I recommend you also um, get rid of the title screen here. Get rid of this, uh, because this, is a, this title card does not create a good first impression because of the different fonts uh, and because of the like menu that the viewer is going to have no use for. They're going to look at this and think, wait, is this really the main menu with all the text here? Um, so get rid of the main menu. Maybe put Otana big down here. Um, this is a really cool shot. It is not gameplay footage, uh, which, which makes it look pretty diverse. You generally don't want to have text in your footage uh, because the player viewers will be reading the text and not listening to your voiceover and not studying the actual gameplay footage. And then when the text goes away way faster than anyone can read it and new text jumps up to take their attention, it's gonna feel very frustrating to them. Um, the game has a moody tone, but it doesn't actually feature the nuclear blast, right? So this game has a really kind of cool nuclear blast that happens. In fact, that could be a really cool way to start the trailer. Um, uh, but it's not in there. Um, the game also, th this footage is currently using very cartoony and kind of clashy sprites for the enemies. They've been updated since, but you're going to want to record your re-record your footage. Um, hearing the moody narration and the moody story, and then seeing these adorable kind of unfinished characters hopping around in a cute fashion is really kind of weird. It's, it's sort of like you're murdering these helpless, cute cartoon robots. Um because they somehow impaled all your friends on spikes. It just, it, it's really, it doesn't quite match up. Um, I recommend you, you sort of, the narrator sort of talks about the game mechanics, but doesn't quite link them up to the fact that, that he's constantly losing health. So the narrator says something like, I will brave the fallout. And, but that's it. That's it. He doesn't say anything about, or, uh, about like the fact that this, this is a game in which you are, need to constantly move. Right? Or the fact that you gain health by attacking enemies in this game. These are really, really important gameplay mechanics that you must, you must tell the users. Otherwise, there's a very high chance they will watch this footage and see this as a moody but fairly generic platformer uh, and then not play it. Um, this is a really unique platformer because its game mechanics force you to really go on the offensive and move quickly. But you have to make sure they understand that. You're constantly losing health in this game due to the radiation, and you need to attack and go on the offensive hard to keep your health up, okay? So see if you can change the narration a little bit to make that more obvious, or you know, have the moody narration at the beginning and then bring in another announcer that says, you know, um, uh, you know uh, this, this game is a 2D platformer, this game is a 2D platformer in which you are constantly losing health and must go on the offensive to get it back, right? Uh, and, and, and someone who will go through and explain the mechanics very clearly and articulately, okay? All right, team. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you so much, all of you. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of frustrating, I know, to have people uh, you know, judging stuff that's incomplete. This is just a draft, right? Uh, but don't let it get to you, okay? You'd much rather have us judge it and give you all this feedback than get to the showcase and have your friends and family and managers and the wider internet judging you there. Okay, uh, they they may be uh, maybe not not as um, not as helpful as your, your peers can be. 
Okay, so everyone, we're gonna take a five minute break. Please, if you need this feedback, go watch it on Twitch because that actually has the chat replay where you'll get to see the chat's feedback as well as uh, hear mine, okay? And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, it is worth putting a couple people on this trailer to write some new code, create some new components, throw some new cameras in the scene uh, to get the perfect shots. Perfect shots that are not distracting, that uh, show you exactly what the, you you need the viewer to see, but no more. Uh, and uh, and you'll you'll get a really really nice trailer. Okay, uh, that's very impactful. Okay, let's take about five minutes, team. I'm gonna turn on the music and then we're gonna fly through this business lecture. Okay, uh, so buckle up. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's get some uh, some game music going again. Um. Ah, it's too intense. Let's go with some Spyro. Okay, we'll see you at 145, team. Ask any questions you might have.
aim store over Steam, for instance. Then these things can be explained in large part by ecosystems. Ecosystem maps. Uh, chat, riddle me this. Have you ever heard, a lot of you are into startups uh, and technology is full of startups and VC, venture capital money. Have you ever heard that venture capitalists really like the word platform? Have you ever talked with a startup or gone to a startup's webpage and seen the word platform? Okay, the reason platform is the magic word that scores you a ton of money from uh, venture capitalists is because it's, it's a synonym for ecosystem, okay? We are not a single product that we're going to sell and then be done with. We are a platform where you're going to engage over years and we're going to find ways to trade value. We'll find a way to do something that you value. You'll give us money for doing that thing, okay? Uh, that is an ecosystem. That is a platform. And that is why VCs tend to care most about that. And that's why startups and small teams tend to care a lot about it, okay? The, the Epson, okay, the Epson Workhorse Printer uh, is a platform. It is an ecosystem. And here is the ecosystem. You've got the hardware for 99 bucks. That's strangely cheap, isn't it? But then you've got the ink. The ink is not a one-time purchase. It's a recurring purchase. And that is the thing that gets people excited these days. Okay, it is a very lucrative ongoing purchase. This is the ecosystem map for the Epson Workforce printer, not Workhorse, Workforce. You've got the hardware, that's okay, but not super interesting. You've got the ink, okay? It is almost the same price as the hardware, but you have to pay it every several months, okay? It's kind of um, abusive in my opinion, uh, but it is, uh, um, you know, it is an ecosystem. Not all ecosystems will be this evil, uh, fortunately. Um, so let's uh, move on. I want to talk a little bit about some ecosystem that you're very familiar with, the phone ecosystem. Okay, you all have a smartphone, or many of you, I think most of you probably have a smartphone. Uh, and you, chances are, you know, a lot of you have iPhones, right? Uh, but a lot of you have uh, the Google phones. A lot of you might have a Huawei phone, uh, a OnePlus, uh, which is what I've got. Um, there are all sorts of phones out there from different manufacturers. What I want to do is I want to show you the ecosystem map for the iPhone, okay? And this is usually where I get you to draw your own ecosystem maps, but I'm just going to show it to you, okay? Actually, you know what? I'm going to give you 30 seconds. You have 30 seconds, team, to think about how are all the different ways that Apple and you trade money and value around the iPhone, okay? What services are surrounding the iPhone beyond just buying the hardware? What do you think of? Go ahead and um, go ahead and post it in the chat if you can. What comes to mind? Mysterious slowdowns when a new phone is released. Oof, that that hurts. That hurts me right here. The Genius Bar dongle to use normal headphone. iMusic AirPods. These are great. These are really good. The Genius Bar for the upsell, right? Do they upsell you with the Genius Bar? Did they do that? I thought they were only for support. In-house repairs and anti-self-repair lobbying. Absolutely. Now, this is all a little bit cynical. Uh, here's the ecosystem map that I came up with. You've got an iPhone. Let's say you've got the iPhone 8, okay? At the time I created this, uh, and I can't remember when I created it, unfortunately, uh, but this hardware was about 820 bucks, okay? That is not chump change. That's a lot of money. Um, uh, but there's also iCloud, okay? So iCloud is a, it can be a $1 a month service that gets you like, I think 50 gigabytes of storage uh, for your backup photos, for your backup files and stuff like that. That doesn't sound like a lot of money, but that is $1 per month per user who uses it, okay? And that adds up fast because this has over a billion users, okay? So we know, uh, I think I, I checked the SEC filing to discover this. Um, uh, we know they make at least a billion bucks off of this every single month off of the service. Uh, they made a lot of money off the hardware, of course. Um, but what about the App Store? Ah, yes, yes, yes. So there are a lot of really great uh, third-party companies making good software for the uh, ecosystem. And uh, Apple will take a 30% cut of all the revenue that goes to those companies, okay? Well, that's a lot of money. Uh, the SEC filing I read said something like $21 billion had been made, I think, that quarter. Uh, uh, from App Store, Apple's slice of the App Store cut, okay? Um, 
What about Apple Music? That Someone said that in chat. Uh, $10 per month and it has 11 million users. That's a lot of change right there. Um, what about uh, stickers? Did any of you think about this? When you buy an Apple product, you get stickers for free, okay? It's almost like you're joining a club because you have the stickers that then you, you then put on your laptop, you then put on your fridge, you put on your car, okay? Uh, and that is implicit free advertising uh, uh, for Apple, right? You are advertising for them uh, and you get a cool sticker in return. What about the Apple developer program? If you want to create apps and all your friends are doing it, right? You, wanna, you want to, uh, to, to chase the, the, the dream of, of making the big viral app, um, well, then you got to pay 99 bucks annually to have that opportunity to try, okay? What about the Apple Watch? Does anyone have an Apple Watch? Well, as it turns out, it has its own hardware, and I think it even has its own uh, store, okay? Okay, so nice chunk of, change, chunk of change there. Oh, I'm blocking it. Here we go. Hardware, 329 Um, What about, you, you know, the iPhone really goes well with the Mac, doesn't it? Oh yeah, you got that iPhone, so your next computer's got to be a Mac, right? Um, so the uh, iPhone ecosystem connects very strongly to the Mac ecosystem. And once you have a Mac, maybe because you initially had an iPhone, the Mac has its own hardware, which, and it has its own app store, and it has its own developer program. So now we have multiple ecosystems all based around different products that um, re kind of reinforce each other, okay? Apple, by some measurements, is the most valuable company in the world. And part of it is because they are so incredibly good at building out an ecosystem that a lot of people feel is a little bit abusive, but a lot of people feel is a really good service, right? A lot of people really enjoy the Apple ecosystem, despite how expensive it can be, uh, because everything works really well together. Uh, there are solutions to basically any problem that you would have and they all just work pretty well. Um, but uh, yeah, I left this ecosystem because uh, of the like outrageous cost of cables. I would pay $70 for a charge cable? Are you kidding me? I could get that for any other phone on Amazon for like five bucks. Anyway, um, uh, ecosystems, they're really important to companies these days. Uh, you can get a lot of this information via the uh, SEC filings that are required of any public company uh, in America. Okay, uh, so you can learn this stuff if you want to, if you're bored. Um, Apple's now $1 trillion, which is amazing, uh, because especially considering that they were almost bankrupt um, just a couple decades ago, they needed a bailout from Microsoft, uh, which is a very interesting story in itself. Why would Microsoft bail out their biggest competitor? Um, and I, I believe if you look into it, it'll come down to, to antitrust. Um, Microsoft would much rather have a com you know one competitor that's alive but struggling the no competitors and the government breathing down their neck and trying to break them up. Let's talk about games, okay? What kind of ecosystems could we have around games? Well, if we look at the kind of 1998, you know, late 90s scene, you had a lot of games that had pretty simple ecosystems. Take, for instance, StarCraft, right? The original StarCraft, it had a game disc you bought for 50, 60 bucks, right? A lot of money. Um, you had implicit advertising due to the fact that this is a strongly multiplayer game, which means that you know, if you have 10 people who buy StarCraft, they're going to want to get the most out of that game purchase. So they're probably going to recommend the game if they like it to their friends. That's free advertising for you, right? They wouldn't do that if it was just a single player only game. And maybe in a couple years, an expansion pack will come out. It might be cheaper than the base game, but you know, that's pretty much it, isn't it? Like that is basically the entire ecosystem uh, for this game. Uh, in, in many ways, this is really awesome. Like for the consumer, this is a very simple ecosystem. You, you, you're able to understand exactly how much money you're gonna trade for the experience you're getting. You're gonna pay down some money and you get the game. You can play the game as long as you want. You can do whatever you want with that game. And then if you like it, in a few years, the expansion pack comes out, you can buy it. So it's really good for consumers. But you know who this isn't good for? Developers. So development in games, game development has been a really risky business for a long time. And it's much better these days, uh, but in the 90s, you know, in the 80s, 90s, it was really, really tough. If you were running a game studio, 
you know, you are spending millions and millions and millions of dollars every year, probably every month, to employ some really talented, uh, hardworking people to make your game. I want you to imagine that you spend two years, you know, with a team of 20 to 30 people. You spend many millions of dollars, and then the game comes out, and it's a flop. The game comes out, and it's a flop. Hey, it happens all the time, right? Go on itch.io. There are flops everywhere you see, right? Games that come out, and they, they're potentially good games, but they just don't get that much attention. You know? What happens to your company? What happens to all those people who put their trust in you, who have been working super hard, uh, who want to keep their jobs, who are raising their own families, who are putting kids through school? What happens? Chances are your company's gone. And a lot of people have their lives uh, uh, disrupted wholesale. So this is a model that's really nice for consumers, but it relies on hits. It relies on uh, uh, the, the early 80s, the, the late 90s was very much a hit-driven business for games. You would spend a long block of time, two or three years making a game, and you had to pray that it was a hit. If it wasn't a hit, you were dead. If it was a hit, then maybe you would live long enough to get an expansion pack out, and hopefully live long enough after that to get your next game out, and it better be a hit too, or you're going to die, okay? There just wasn't all that many ways to keep people engaged with your company, your products. There weren't really too many ways for your products to cover for each other. There weren't really ways to get your players excited about a game experience that maybe didn't initially take off. So let's go ahead and come to 2016, okay? The same company, the same company... Uh, has made a game called Overwatch. And what's interesting is that it isn't $50, $60. Overwatch is $40 to get the base game, okay? But it's a little bit more than StarCraft, okay? Because you got $40 for the base game. But how do you launch, how do you launch Overwatch? When you launch Overwatch because you want to play it, it's a fun game. You see, what? Several other games, don't you? Interesting. You get to see, you use the Battle.net launcher. The Battle.net launcher will make it very obvious if there have been any super cool updates to Diablo or StarCraft or uh, any of the other, uh, maybe World of Warcraft, any of the other Blizzard games. That's pretty neat, huh? Um, what's more is that when you are not playing this game, there's a good chance you're browsing some social media and, oh my gosh, there's an Overwatch comic book. All right. So I can engage with these characters and I can learn more about this universe. I can get more invested. I could spend more time uh, in this really cool uh, fictional universe that Blizzard created. And when I'm not watching comic books, ooh, have you heard about the new character that came out with the new trailer? There's a new Overwatch trailer. You know how good Blizzard is with their, their cinematics. You've got to watch that, right? In fact, maybe you get together with uh, friends who are into the game and you watch it together. What about social media integration? These games all have their own social media accounts these days. If you do something super cool and post it online, they'll retweet you and you'll get a billion followers. Uh, you'll be a, a popular uh, kid and get those internet points, right? Don't you want to uh, post all your coolest Overwatch uh, stuff on the internet uh, to help with their advertising, right? What about timed events? Hey, the Olympics is coming up. Uh, Overwatch has a cool Olympic event, and you can get cool costumes. You can get cool special limited time uh, uh, stickers. Hey, you might want to jump back in. I heard there's a new game mode coming out that uh, might only be here during Halloween, right? So I better get playing again, right? Even if I didn't enjoy the game, maybe I really like a, a costume and want to try and get it. And then, oh my goodness, loot crates. My gosh, the loot crates, right? The very progression system in Overwatch itself uh, kind of highly incentivizes you going after loot crates uh, via gameplay, or eventually, if you really want to guarantee you get what you want, you're going to end up spending a lot of money to buy them. But note the cost here, right? Um, not everyone will be able to, to afford like a $30, $40 expansion pack or a sequel to the game, but a lot of families can afford you know, a $2 loot crate for someone's birthday, right? That's not a huge chunk of change uh, in many households at least. Uh, and so, if you look at this, there are just a billion ways that this game can trade value with the consumers, um, and maybe not all of them ethical, uh, uh, but, but maybe some of them, some players really like, right? 
Um, it's been said a lot about how microtransactions are kind of a, a scourge on the industry, uh, and they are changing how games are designed, right? And, and affecting the experience for a lot of people, right? It doesn't feel good to pay a base amount of money for the game, and then if you want more stuff within it, you have to pay more money. But I'd like you to think a little bit about mobile games, right? Mobile games are one of the biggest uh, sec segments of the, um, the, uh, the, the, the game product population right now. And gaming is a really expensive hobby. It used to be that unless you were in kind of a middle class, upper class family, you couldn't really engage a lot in games. But today, there are just thousands, tens of the hundreds of thousands of games available for you for free, right? You can engage with this medium in a way that you were locked out of uh, because, you know, mobile games, many games these days are free to play. And it makes, uh, they become sustainable by um, uh, getting revenue from people who are really into it. And that allows so many people to engage with this uh, fantastic art form uh, that they really couldn't in the past. So it's, it's a tough question. Uh, microtransactions, what they've done, the growth of ecosystems, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Um, it's very nuanced and it, it, it behooves you to think about this stuff deeply. Okay, why is this stuff happening? Where is it going? And what do I think about it? Okay, I don't want to render judgment. Okay, an anonymous Ann Arbor developer has said, uh, told me uh, last year, the rise of games as a service has changed the developer-publisher dynamic. Um, so now that ecosystems are present in many of these games, developers actually matter. Their lives have improved, right? In the past, publishers could force harsh deals on developers. Once the game was finished, who cares if the original development team survived at all? However, in 2019, if your developer goes under because of a harsh deal that you imposed, then you lose your entire ecosystem because they're the ones running it, right? Who else can maintain and service uh, your big ecosystem around your Overwatch product? You need to suddenly keep your developers alive. Um, this is to say that as nasty as some of this is for the consumer, this has stabilized the industry quite a bit, right? Um, if your game flops, there are other games that you have that can support you, keep your team alive while you try and figure out what to do next. If you, you know, if your game launches and it doesn't have a big user base, that might still be enough to keep you alive because those users who really love your game will be spending a lot and investing a lot in it, okay? So it's a very, very interesting time that we live in as these business models fluctuate and as that has an impact on the consumers and on the developers and on the games themselves. So we return to this question. If you remember last time, these games on the left were third-party published games. These have microtransactions. Overwatch, Shadow of War, Battlefront 2. On the right here are first-party games, companies that also have a console. They don't just make games, they make the hardware. Sea of Thieves, Microsoft, Horizon Zero Dawn, Sony, and uh, Mario Odyssey, N Nintendo. Loot boxes on the left, no loot boxes, no microtransactions on the right. And the reason are ecosystems. A third-party publisher, they do not have a console. They do not have an ecosystem. They can't get license fees from other developers publishing games to their console because they have no console, right? They have to expand and make money and become sustainable and lower their risks some way. And so those other services get into the games themselves. On the right, we have people, we have teams that make consoles. When you make a console, you get licensing fees, right? If it's a popular console, you make a ton of money because everyone wants to publish a game on it. As a result, you don't really need your games to make a ton of money. Mario Odyssey doesn't need to make a ton of money. Neither does Sea of Thieves or Horizon Zero Dawn. All they need to do is get people to buy the console. That's it, okay? Mario doesn't need to come close to making its money back, though I'm pretty sure it does. All it needs to do is make that person decide, I need a Nintendo Switch. And the ecosystem covers all the cost to make that possible, okay? All right, this happens in real life too. We've talked about the um, Disney World in the past. We've talked about theme park uh, parks. In fact, in our first lecture, we did so. Riddle me this, team. It costs typically a certain amount of money to get into the park, but once you're inside the park, Space Mountain, one of the most expensive and cool rides in the entire park, most unique, uh, most effort put into it, is the exact same cost to ride as the teacup ride, which seemingly every park has, and they're usually not that exciting, and it's extremely cheap, okay? 
Why on earth would a company create something as expensive as Space Mountain when it doesn't make any more money for them than the teacup ride? The job of the Space Mountain and the e-ticket rides, the show-stopping rides, the rides that hit the internet, that hit the newspapers when they launch, the job of those is not to make money. They are loss leaders. What they need to do is they need to get people into the park where the $10 turkey leg, right? The, the $10 uh, cup of juice, the $10 Harry Potter pumpkin juice thing, the, the $50 Harry Potter wand that's actually super cheap to make, but you'll pay for it, right? Because you're there. That is where the money is made, okay? The rides get you into the park, right? Make the ecosystem viable and healthy, and then the ecosystem takes care of the rest. The ecosystem has food that's overpriced and makes that money back. They have merchandise. Why does every ride funnel you through a, 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 a gift shop, right? Because that is really where the money is made. People who are crazy fans, want to buy every piece of merchandise, uh, fund the rides that everyone else enjoys. Um, and then, of course, like the rides can help with the brand IP so that if someone enjoys the ride, they might go watch the next movie, right? Anyway, that is the power of ecosystems. You see them everywhere these days. And without saying, you know, uh, without declaring them a good or bad thing, they are a very impactful thing. And so you got to understand them, okay? Okay, next up, I want to talk about value chains. And this is pretty fun. Uh, okay, imagine this is Timmy, okay? Timmy has $9. Timmy is a student at the University of Michigan and the pandemic is over. Congrats. And Timmy's really hungry. So Timmy goes to Panda Express, okay? Timmy hands $9 for a plate of orange chicken and something else to Panda Express. Okay, here's the question. Does Panda Express get all nine of those dollars? Can they really choose what they want to do with those nine bucks? The answer is really no, okay? That $9 goes to Panda, but Panda can't keep those $9. Because as it turns out, Panda needs to spend money to do its job. It gives $2, let's say, to the trucking company, and then it uses $5 to pay employees, okay, from that $9. You'll notice this adds up to 7 and so Panda essentially kept $2 of margin off that $9 meal. However, that $2 going to the trucking company... Uh, is uh, is not going to stay with that trunk company either because maybe that company needs to purchase the actual produce uh, that they then get to Panda. So a dollar goes to the farm, okay? And this is a chain. This is a chain of value. The value starts at the customer and it flows through, okay? Uh, depending on how much of that money and value each person is able to kind of keep to themselves, uh, that kind of tells you the value of each part of the chain, okay? The employees, uh, as one would expect, being the most valuable part of the um, of the, uh, the 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 meal, okay? The meal chain for Panda. Okay, this is not necessarily super accurate, but this is a way that you can think uh, about how money flows through an ecosystem and supports a bunch of different entities, okay? Now, let's say this isn't enough, okay? Panda pocketed $2, and that's not enough because... KFC just launched a game studio, and as we know, game studios are expensive. So Panda needs more than $2 uh, to be able to compete, okay? So what are they going to do? Well, one thing they can do uh, is they can do a buyout, okay? They can look at this part of the value chain and say, you know what? I bet we can be a bit more efficient with this. And, you know, if we can be more efficient, then we don't need to give $2 to this part of the chain. We can keep that, okay? We can keep more of it anyway. So let's say that they buy out and then do an incredibly good job in making this part of the chain efficient. Well, now that $9 goes to Panda and they send $5 out to employees, but none through this chain or less through this chain. Now Panda is pocketing $4, double what they were uh, in the previous uh, version of the chain, okay? So we got $4 per meal that Panda can put to other stuff if they want to. So let's get back to games. Let's say you made a really great game, and you have, right? You've made your P3 games. They're super fun. We just got to sell them. We just got to work on the marketing for them. Um, and here comes the money, right? Well, maybe, maybe not, okay? This is much more realistic. And I've asked some industry in inside. Actually, I asked a GameStop executive uh, what this breakdown was. Let's say that Timmy goes to GameStop with $60, okay? GameStop, you know, and you're over here in the corner, by the way. It's a very lonely place. Let's say that GameStop needs to purchase that game, right? So they send $45 to the warehouse. The warehouse, in order to have the game, sends $30 to Sony. Sony takes their licensing fee, 
and as a result, $15 gets to you, okay? So if a player spends $60 on a retail game in a retail store, only a fraction of that, about 25% is getting to the end developers. And that's really tough, right? Imagine a world where, you know, instead of getting 25%, you're getting more like 70%, right? Or, you know, that is, um, that's, that's quite a lot. That's around three times more than you would have. In other words, if you can get three times more, roughly, of the value of the game you made, in order to get the same amount of money, you only have to sell one third of the number of copies. And that makes it much more tractable to do because selling games is very tough, right? Let's say that we change this chain because this is the retail chain. Let's go digital, okay? Let's say that instead of going to GameStop, this $60 goes to Valve. It goes to Steam, okay? They use Steam to buy your game. Valve currently takes a 30% cut, uh, but you know the math is a little bit different here. Um, let's say you end up with around $45 instead, right? That is a huge difference, okay? You've gone from getting 15 through retail for every copy sold to 45. This is one of the reasons a ton of developers only release digitally. It's much easier to do, there are less parts of the chain, and the rates are much better for you. But let's say that this still isn't good enough, okay? Uh, let's say this still isn't... I actually kind of liked the uh, Colonel Sanders game. Um, okay, uh, let's say that this isn't enough, okay? Because you're Electronic Arts and uh, you want to make even more, okay? Well, maybe there could eventually be a way to where the money from the user goes directly to you. There's no one in the middle of the value chain. You are the chain, okay? Or you are higher up the chain and can more dominate it, all right? Let's say that you are EA, Okay. Now, instead of this money flowing through Steam, right, and then to you, you could create your own digital service, like Origin. The money flows to your service, and then because it's your service, you get to keep it, right? It doesn't take a cut from you. It takes a cut from everyone else. Notice, not only are you keeping more of the value of games that you make, but you're getting a small slice of the value of games that, uh, uh, that are made by others. Right? Uh, so that's going to be really, really helpful for you, particularly if a lot of people use this platform. Okay? If no one uses the platform, then you're really just, you're just keeping more of your own money. But you're probably use, losing a lot of users, too, because a lot of users prefer Steam to Origin. Okay? Um, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so this is a, uh, in 2020, uh, Capcom was hacked, unfortunately, uh, by a bunch of uh, criminals. And one of the uh, pieces of information that came out of that hack was the fact that Stadia... Google Stadia had a deal with Capcom. Uh, they paid Capcom $10 million to put Resident Evil 7 and Resident Evil 8 on the Stadia uh, uh, cloud uh, gaming uh, platform. Sony paid $5 million for a timed Resident Evil 7 VR exclusivity. So sometimes if your games are valuable enough, these insider platforms will actually pay you to make sure that your game goes down their chain, their branch of the chain and not someone else's, okay? So anyway, uh, this stuff really, really matters. Um, so a question, what happened to GameStop? So GameStop, I'm not talking about this recent um, uh, uh, crazy business going on um, uh, with their, their short squeeze. Um, what used to happen, right, is, well, essentially GameStop got squeezed out of the value chain. We need to go fast, though. Let's talk a little bit about cloud streaming. So currently, it takes a lot of money to buy a console and then $60 per game. That is an expensive ecosystem that a lot of these companies have running, okay? And then a certain amount of that money goes to the actual creators of the game, okay? Now, with the advent of streaming platforms, um, they're not... I think they'll take off a lot more in the future. Stadia might not be the one to break out. But it's very interesting what the future could hold because with streaming platforms, there is no console. The player simply plays games through their web browser. They still pay $60 for each game, but this could result in there being way more users for these ecosystems. As a result, Stadia can actually afford to give a better cut uh, to the developers. And that could make more developers release for this ecosystem down here, and it could eventually become the dominant ecosystem apart from the console ecosystems that we currently see, okay? All right, uh, so yeah you'll notice that a lot of these companies got really nervous, Kermit the Frog nervous, um, uh, and they signed a bunch of deals with each other, right? When their ecosystem is threatened, they all kind of group up and team up and say, hey, we're gonna create our own streaming services 
And they did. In fact, Microsoft and Sony are working together on their streaming services, which is crazy, right? Fierce rivals doing this. GameStop. Before the crazy short squeeze of 2020, um, GameStop Corp was in big, big trouble, okay? Or was it 2021? GameStop was in trouble, okay? What essentially happened was what had happened to a lot of retail giants, like Macy's, Sears, Kroger, and that uh, Amazon showed up, okay? Amazon showed up and squeezed them out of their value chain. Blockbuster is the, is the example of this. There's one Blockbuster left. Uh, in 1985, they had 85,000 employees, and now they have one store remaining, okay? Where were they in the value chain? They were a company that rented out games. They rented out physical copies of games and movies. So if you didn't want to buy a game, what you'd do is you'd go to Blockbuster uh, and you would pay uh, to uh, rent a game instead. And then you'd have to return it after a few days. Um, this was really great for the consumer because they could experiment, they could try out a game, and if they could beat the game soon enough, they didn't have to pay as much money to actually get that full experience. But it was really, really bad for the developers and the publishers, okay? Imagine building a game and then you sell one copy to Blockbuster and then Blockbuster rents that copy out to 10,000 people. Do you get 10,000 sales as the developer or one sale? The answer is the latter. Your game was played 10,000 times, uh, uh, was purchased 10,000 times, but you only got uh, the revenue from one sale. In other words, everyone hated Blockbuster's guts, okay? The developers, the publishers, and so they started working to squeeze them out, and they absolutely successfully did. What happened to Blockbuster? Games and film and media went, retail, went uh, digital. So Netflix happened. Um, Netflix showed up, and suddenly there was no need for an intermediary. There was no need for that middle part of the value chain, okay? The chain used to go from consumer, blockbuster, and then maybe some money trickled down to developer, okay? Suddenly it was going uh, uh, customer, creator, okay? And Blockbuster had nothing to offer because they don't create movies. They just take what other people create and they rent them out. It provided distribution, but distribution became super, super easy. When digital distribution took off, they had no place in the value chain and they dried up. They got absolutely crushed, okay? Anyway, they provided value within their chain at some point, but something changed. Digital distribution showed up and they no longer provided any value, okay? This is the exact thing that can happen to teams that you join at companies. This can happen to teams you join, to labs you join in graduate school, okay? Are you joining a team that is going to be important to the company for a long time? Are you joining uh, a, the, the Kindle team? Are, are you going to work at Amazon and joining the Amazon restaurants team? And then suddenly, a month after you join, Amazon announces that there's this new, you know, there's this new team in the company, this new service that is gonna take drones and deliver food from the restaurants, okay? Is your team now redundant? Do you need to find a new team? Are you gonna be gone in a month, right? Are you gonna be gone in a year, uh, your team made redundant? So you need to think about this stuff. What value do you truly provide to your communities, to your businesses, to your teams, to your companies? Uh, and then, you know, is when that shifts, are you still providing that value or do you need to go do something else to continue to be impactful? This is stuff you really, really need to think about and it, it doesn't just happen to companies, okay? It can happen to teams and people as well. So tools for business questions. Why did loot boxes appear? Why did EA create Origin? Why is GameStop and Freefall? These can all be answered using ecosystem map and value chain. So keep these tools in your mind and think about them when a weird company does a weird thing in the future. Okay, why could they be doing this? What are they thinking about? What do they value? Um, there are a lot of really cool resources if you're interested in uh, learning more about how companies and corporations do their thing and why they do their thing. Um, and uh, one of those is uh, Company Man, which is a really interesting and, and well-run channel that will go into what happened to Chuck E. Cheese. You know, where are they now? What, what, what mistakes did they made? What is happening to ESPN right now, right? It's really interesting stuff. So anyway... Uh, that is uh, that is pretty much it. We didn't get to AI. I think we'll we might get into a little bit of that next time, but we really need to go over some other stuff uh, like watching your trailers and doing our final lecture. So we'll probably do a little bit of AI. 
But otherwise, um, you, can, um, you can always ask me after the course, and I'll provide the slides. And you can also watch last semester's recording of that lecture if you want to, okay? Otherwise, team, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Well done on the drafts, but please, go back to those draft trailers and put the time in, okay? Uh, we've got one week left. Uh, uh, hit the gas the pedal to the metal, and uh, you won't regret it, I guarantee it, okay? Thank you very much, team. Uh, we will see you next time. I'll be back in about... Uh, 10 minutes, uh, actually prop out 235, and we'll do all this again. We'll get your trailer drafts some more feedback, okay? Take care, team. Uh, ask any questions in the chat, and I'll ask, uh, answer them during this break, okay? See you soon. Bye-bye.